Do you think once a cheater, always a cheater? On this week's episode, we talk to a psychotherapist about healing after divorce. Welcome to the Ask a Matchmaker podcast. I'm your host, Matchmaker Maria. I am so excited for this week's episode because we have two guests on the couch. First is psychotherapist Lisa Braitman. Lisa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to talk about your newest book, workbook, Mm -hmm. The Courage to Walk Away. We're going to talk all about it today. And I also want to welcome Matchmaker Chrisula back on the podcast. (laughs) Hi. Hi. I feel like the previous episode, we didn't get enough anxiety from you. I'm so happy you're back for I'm more. I'm so glad we have a psychotherapist to uh, to uh, to have next to me for my uh, ongoing anxiety. I'm so sweating. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I love I'm it. I'm glad. I love it. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Lisa, I loved receiving your book. Um, you help people move on after infidelity, after breaking up, after divorcing, Tell me a little bit more about your background and how you found this niche of therapy. Um, I've been a psychotherapist for over 20 years. And within that 20 year period, a lot of different people come in when they suspect something, whether infidelity could be financial, emotional or sexual. And most people think when they hear infidelity that it's sexual. That's the first thing that always comes out of someone, you know, oh, that happened. But Betrayal takes many forms. Right. I mean, even in reading your workbook, as I was flipping through it, chapter six is financial infidelity. Mm-hmm. And I was I had never heard those two words together. What does that mean? It's about secrets. It's one thing if you want to keep your financial life separate and you're open about it and you've discussed it. But it's another thing when you said, this is what I have and we're building a life together. And then all of a sudden, five years, 10 years down the line, you have all this money in secret account that you've been really keeping private and separate because maybe your parents said, you never know, divorce rate is high, make sure you protect yourself. But By protecting yourself, you're also damaging your relationship, especially when it gets found out. You take clients both solo and in couples. Mm -hmm. Yes. When you are talking to couples, do you talk about the lifestyle and the combination of finances? Absolutely. If it's an issue coming in, one of them usually if finance is a problem, whether it's spending too much money, spending too little money, or hiding money, one of the one person will come in and bring it up and the other one will sit there very uncomfortably because they've been trying to keep this a secret for a long time and now it, it's blown open. And once it's blown open, you just can't just sweep that under the rug and say, well, I'm sorry, I, because the first lie that mm-hmm. that was told is now backed up by a thousand more lies to support the first lie. Right. So it's betrayal in the sense of, yes, you kept it a secret, but you kept on keeping it a secret for the last five, 10 years. And how many secrets did you keep after the first initial one? What about when, I mean, this just reminds me, I mean, I've listened to so many stories where um, people are in uh, abusive relationships and the only way to leave is to make a separate account. Um, right. I mean, that is like par for survival. Like I can only get out by putting this amount of money or my allowance for the week, five, $5 of that 20 is going to go into this account. So eventually I can escape this relationship. Uh, when, when you have people coming into your office and explaining that, like, when they have they feel the need to do that like the relationship is already over even if they don't realize that do you they get are... clients like that occasionally occasionally when it comes to abuse it's 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 a whole different ball game the right. same rules don't apply mm. for abuse as they do a relationship where there's not abuse but there's just hiding right when abuse when when abuse is on the table the most important thing is for the person who's being abused to find a way out and yeah. that and and money is often a way to do that and it's very often in those situations the person who's being abused sometimes more often than not is not in control of the finances 
Right, right, but right. But that's, that's protection in a different way. That's yeah. not a protection in case we get divorced. That's a protection I am not safe and I have to do everything yeah. I have to do. So that, the same rules don't yeah. apply there. What about the couples that we know that um, uh, we see it all the time where they're Venmoing each other <laughs> money for diapers? Uh, which I always found really strange because don't you live under well, the same... Well, hold on. Let's take a step back, okay? Yeah. Hold on a second. When you have couples come in, do they come in typically before shit hits the fan or after? It's or is that the wrong terminology <laughs> altogether? It, 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 it depends. Some people come in... It's different now, even than it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, people would come in when they were married. Now they come in before they're married because they're living together for so many years. Right. Um, some people come in because they see this is going to be a problem or they're planning a wedding and all of a sudden finances comes center because now you're involving your parents often in the financial part of it. Mm. So shit hit shitting shit hitting the fan yeah um that is the ways. technical term that is the clinical term <laughs> it, it goes both ways some right. people come when there's chaos the, they're getting married in three months and one wants a prenup and the other one doesn't they come in because you know they've pretty much paid for the wedding this is what they want to do but they're getting pressure from family okay so they'll come in because they they're running out of time and they don't have the they're they don't have the time to work it out over time but some people come in and say you know I've been working for 10 years she's been working for five years I don't necessarily want to just put our names together on everything but what what are the ways we can move forward that we're together so we don't have separate um, Venmo accounts for diapers or I got this coffee and you got that because that's a nickel and diming situation. Which is not healthy in any relationship. No. It's I feel like that yeah. becomes your roommate instead of your spouse. Right. Your ride or die, your partner, your teammate in life. Right. So what some people do in the, initially or even once they move in together, even if they're not engaged or married, they'll have one account that they'll contribute to for the household items. You know, sometimes couples start that way. Some some couples don't start until actually they, they get engaged or they're married or they're starting to receive gifts from people. Mm. So the thing is, I never I mentioned this in, in my book. In one example, one couple had a very long engagement because of COVID. So they had a two, ended up with a two year engagement instead of the year that they were planning on. And they were getting a tremendous amount of gifts and checks and items and it doesn't belong in one person's account. Just because right. it came from your Uncle Sal doesn't mean it goes into your account. That's a good time to start hours. Right. I think that's when, I don't know about you, but when I, I remember when I got engaged and we started getting those first checks, that's when we went to the bank and we made our, our joint checking, right. which is what we now, that's our, that's our checking account. Like I don't have a separate... Personally, I'm sure other people do. That's just what works for us. Mm -hmm. We had done it for insurance because like uh, we weren't we had just gotten engaged or about to get engaged, me and Yanni. And uh, in order for because I had a really good insurance and in order for him to get insurance, we had to show cohabitation. You mean health insurance? Health insurance. Yeah. So we had to show cohabitation. But we also had to show that we had a, sh a bank account together. And uh, we were like, well, what are we doing? We're, this is where we're going anyway. So that's when we combined it. And that was that. Right. Uh, finance like, meets, meets yeah. romance. Yeah. Finance <laughs> yeah. meets romance. Do you think that's not sexy or do you think that's sexy, sexy? <laughs> I think it's really practical and there's nothing more important than health insurance. So you can have sexy in a lot of other ways. Yeah. Yeah. But the safety of knowing that if something happened that you're covered and it's also an act of love. As a psychotherapist, yeah. tell me more about that. Why do you say it's an act of love? Because... If you have the stronger health insurance, that's going to cover yeah. a lot more than than your partners. You're saying you're saying to that person even before you get married or even before anything legally happens that I love you enough. I want to make sure I can I can give you this, and I want to know that you're you're going to be safe in case something happens that we can't even imagine right now. So it's an act of love, not just when sh when you get married. It's an act of love prior to that. Right. So is it sexy? 
I can't say it's sexy, but does it show show a bid for love? Absolutely. I am wondering what you advise. I mean, I want to talk a lot about a lot about your book, but mm-hmm. I want but before that, I want to learn more about when your clients come in to talk to you, solo couples, whatever it may be. Do you what is a psychotherapist's responsibilities here? Like, do you hear what they're saying and try to figure out the triggers or, or like help them figure out the triggers or do you also advise them, you know, like, hey, if you did this, it might be better. Like, what what are you what are you advising her? What's what's going on in the I'm office? Not, as a psychotherapist, I'm not big on advising. OK. Per se. But when when a, when a couple comes in, the difference between couples therapy and individual therapy, cup, when the couple comes in, the couple is my client, mm. not the individual. So what is best for both people is what I keep in mind. For individual, the other person they may be talking about, they're not my client. Can you ever take an individual from a couple at the same time? I can. There's certain situations where that makes sense. There's certain situations where I would refer to a colleague. Okay. It, it, it depends what's going on. It depends what's what's needed. Right. But when a, when a first couple comes in, the first thing you find out, you know, it's interesting. Some people are really can't wait to sit down and just their first session. They've had like a year or two of build up, and it's boom. Your mom. <laughs> And then other people are, they're there, they want to be there, they made the appointment, but they're reluctant to say anything because it's an unfamiliar situation. Right. They were told to keep their feelings to themselves. Well, I'm a stranger at that moment. Right. But what's more important is their relationship so they kind of get through it because their relationship is more important than, oh, I'm talking to a stranger. Do you diagnose, like, do you ever find yourself with a couple that maybe one person's like a narcissist? Sure. Okay. (laughs) Absolutely. And does that make the conversations really difficult for you? Not, not, not for me. What the most important thing is when someone comes in is finding out, first of all, why they're there. There are different versions of it because when people come in, even though they think they're coming in for the same reason, when when they're in front of me, what I've discovered is they have very different ideas of what needs to be changed. Can you give us an example? Well, for example, um, one spouse may say, he doesn't listen to me. I feel like he's always on his phone and our communication is is bad because he's you know he doesn't listen to me and and he and he may agree with that because he knows he's on his phone but what he says is we don't have enough sex. So he he came in and that was when I asked him what's on his mind that's what he said and she said this and then she might say well if you weren't on your phone so much maybe we'd have more sex and then we could take it from there. Right. What what's going on is the, their needs their needs are not being met over and over and over again. I'm not talking about you know he things that happen chronically that are like you know low radar of okay this is just part of the deal. Like over a long period of time when your needs aren't being met, you look elsewhere. You stop trying to get what you need from that person because you hit you hit a wall. And so a lot of times when couples come to see me, they hit a wall, but they often hit a different wall for each other. Wow. And in your book, you know, you it's the book, again, is called The Courage to Walk Away. And it's about healing yourself in the aftermath of a breakup or divorce. It is a workbook. And it's really interesting. Um, you know, as you flip through it, there's a lot of questions, I mean, that you give people here. You know, there was one I remember that... Um, divvying up the spoils yeah um there's also you know talks about infidelity but not just financial infidelity like we mentioned before but even emotional infidelity at work um you know create it was called there's like you know it has like what's it called uh it also gives you um ideas about co-parenting and journaling and it's a really interesting it's like really cool about you know, all these strategies and stress relief. So tell me a little bit more about the journey of writing this workbook. Like, how did you go about deciding, you know, what is what topics you're going to put in and in what format? Well, when I was speaking with my publisher, they they really wanted to focus on infidelity. 
Okay. And my early conversations were, I assume you're talking about sexual infidelity. And she said, yes. And I said, but that's not the only type of infidelity there is that really can sabotage and hurt a relationship. And so we had a dialogue about it. And I said, because just as much as um, sexual, I see emotional infidelity. I see financial infidelity. And sometimes you see one or two or three together together which is that much more um, difficult and challenging to to navigate to get through to heal from right. so in, in those early conversations because most of my clients it's not like oh he did this or she did this it's and yeah. this and and, that. and then he she spent all this money at a hotel that's in our city and you know i thought they were in another state you know, so th so it's like somebody is, is is cheating on them sexually, and then they're also spending the household money on someone else, right? Or they also have a gambling problem, and the money they thought they had, they don't, they no longer have. Or even if it's not sexual or financial, in the last I don't know, probably 10, 15 years, we've heard the phrase. My wife, my office husband, my office wife. Right. Mm -hmm. Work wife, work husband. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's something to that because that you you spend more time talking to that person, especially on Monday morning after the weekend on what happened or what you did or the things you were involved in or, and then you, you're comfortable. It's it's like a good friend, but yet it's still. I mean, they're also more work. privy to your to your emotional breakdowns that you're having at work. Like they see that yeah. your husband might not necessarily see you having the emotional breakdown at work. He'll hear your frustration after, but they literally see you maybe crying at your desk and then they are there for you emotionally. And then that's how people become attached to their work husbands and work wives. Right. Uh, so, and then when the, when they leave, that could be devastating. You know, Lisa, yeah, I, re absolutely. Yeah. I recently was watching a video. A woman was filming her interaction with her spouse, which I feel like sometimes women, people will do that because they need evidence for themselves to remind themselves, like, this is a bad situation. Um, right. But in this particular clip, you don't see the faces, but it, you basically hear that she had a baby two days ago. It sounds like they're British based on their accents. Um, so let's just pretend for a second that they live outside of London, right? Mm -hmm. She had a baby, she had a baby two days ago. She's resting. Um, in the shot, you see that she has like four teacups on the table and her husband's come in and he says, you know, my parents are coming over. I need you to make a roast. And she says, can I just remind, you know, your parents are coming and you need me to make a roast. And he's like, yeah. And she says, well, may I remind you that I just gave birth to a baby two days ago and I cannot make a roast for you right now. And he's like, why not? You're just doing nothing. The, you know, and she's like, I'm healing. You're not you're not doing anything. You're wasting time. Look at this. You have four teacups in front of you and you haven't brought them back to the kitchen. And my parents are coming and you need to make a roast. And she says, well, no, you you can make a roast. I am not making a roast. And I'm not, I don't speak British English, but to me, roast sounds some like something that might take a couple, like it's not just simple as like putting some seasoning on a chicken and putting it in. It sounds like a little bit more than that, right? Even the chicken is too much to ask for. That's right. And in listening to this, you know, I had a lot of questions in my mind and one of them relates to, I think a lot of the work that you do, but the first reaction that I had is as a C-section mom, the idea of doing anything for someone the first 10 days is like foreign to me. So I'm, I don't know what this, I mean, the fact that she was home within two days tells me that she probably didn't have a C-section, but well, in uh, in England, they, they don't, they do not leave. They don't let you stay there. Oh, I know. You they go, just like, off you go, go after, goodbye. you know, goodbye. You so. gave birth off you go home. But also I, uh, it made me think about how the way he was talking to her. I mean, this guy sounds like a piece of shit, but <laughs> the way he was talking to her and other clips that I've seen from other people, other couples, is that there are marriages where the husband is treating the wife like his mother, like a teenager complaining to his mother, why didn't you do this? My friends are coming over. You're going to make snacks for us to eat. And then that same wife might go to work, talk to her work husband, who doesn't see her as this exhausted mommy 
Right. And not mommy to the baby, mommy to this adult child who's, you know, uh, from what I'm seeing, rep displaying weaponized incompetence. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Like, do you see this as part of, I don't, I feel like I'm seeing it more and more, but maybe it's because I'm having access because of TikTok where people are filming their conversations and posting them in public. But what do you see? Well, that's, that's a little more extreme example yeah. because the woman just gave birth and even if you don't know anything about giving birth everyone knows that that is you you don't jump up and you know go to the gym afterwards right it it there's a healing period of time but what you're describing it sounds like an accumulation of years of that because i'm sure that didn't come up for the first time in that moment that has been certain patterns of behavior that this couple live by mm -hmm. and maybe it generally what happens is if it starts off with that as a expectation often that deepens over time more entitlement comes to play and it's up to the other person she stood her ground in this situation because it, the the it wasn't a request it was the demand was so egregious to the situation and a lot of people don't say anything until it gets to the point where it's absolutely ridiculous so what's important in that situation is when you see that behavior early on, whether and it could be early on in dating, having certain expectations that you're never going to want to do, but you agree to because you like this person. This is about getting to know yourself better and knowing what your limits are. And if this is the way it is early on and that is not OK with you, you have to not deny yourself the type of relationship where it, it feels equal, where it feels both mutually respected. Because that that's something that has probably been going on for a really long time, and then it just got to the point where she said no. She needed to speak up sooner. Does he need to do some work there? Yes, but she's the one who also, she was a partner in it by accepting it earlier on, if that was the case, which it usually is. Then she talks to the second part of what you're saying is then she talks to her colleague at work who understands how difficult, you know, having a child is and having an infant and total exhaustion. And she metaphorically can put her head on his shoulder mm -hmm. and get the support and the empathy that she really needs that she's not getting at home and over time. And it's not like she's doing anything wrong. But what's going on here is that relationship, that attachment, as you refer mm. to, deepens over time. And now he's the person at work that she talks about the things that are important to her and doesn't talk to her partner about it because she doesn't feel heard, seen, recognized. But the guy at work, he asks all the questions you want, you want someone to be interested in. So, you know, one can lead into another. And when I say it always takes two in a relationship, she needed comfort. She needed empathy. She, she formed an attachment to get that because she wasn't getting it at home. Right. Do you um, do you subscribe? Like, I mean, you when you coach couples, do you coach them when there is infidelity? Like, is there a way out of is there a way to build trust? Yes, absolutely. Not all cup, not all partnerships end with infidelity. Um, it's more challenging than someone who just leaves their clothes on the bathroom floor. You know, like the, the things that we, we hate our partner does that they don't seem to change no matter how we feel about it. So it's challenging. And can you trust again? Yes. Some pe in some situations, and I've, I've had a good amount of situations over the years that doing the work, putting the time in, whether it's therapy, whether it's just making room for each other, learning about themselves to be a better partner over time, they can actually get closer and repair the relationship. But it's, it doesn't happen overnight and it will never happen overnight. You can't just decide, okay, I trust you now that you did that. It takes a lot of work between the two of them. It's like trust is, is, is earned over time. Even if nothing like infidelity happened, trust is earned over time. You start dating somebody. Yeah. You don't trust everything they say in the first day. You're like, oh, that's interesting. I hope that's true. You yeah. don't say, oh, he or she is, she's so that because they said so. 
you 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 kind of collect information. You watch. You look. You listen to what they say match what they do. Right. And when there is tr- when trust has has been injured like this, especially in a long term relationship, it takes a lot. Not just to get back to where they were, because you don't. I don't want them to just to get back to where they were when yeah. this kind of happened. You want them to get to a place um, that's better than that, because they were not good already. If somebody was yeah. cheating, yeah. you know, I, I there's this movie. Uh, what's it called? Uh, He's just not that into you. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a point in the movie where Jennifer Connelly is with Bradley Cooper in uh, Home Depot or something. Mm-hmm. Do you know the part I'm talking about? Yeah. And he tells her they're picking paint for the house. And he tells her, I cheated on you. And he's expecting her at that moment to be like, we're finished. And then she does the most real thing out of the whole movie. It's the most relatable part in the movie where she's like, okay, let's go pick out paint. And he's like... You're not mad at like she's like okay let's let's move on let's pick out paint because we have this big like we have a we have responsibilities we have a mortgage we have responsibilities and like, we'll figure I, it out and it I and see, you're in Home Depot yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah and I feel like that part of the movie was just so interesting to me I I'm, I always think about that part of the movie because I feel like most people would react this way uh, most people would be like all right let's work on it uh, most people would not be like you know I'm gonna burn your clothes. <laughs> get out of my life because life is life is life is more complex than that and messy and messy because maybe there's kids involved and it's not so hard to leave or you have a mortgage and it's now so hard to leave so how do we make it work and if we can both see couples therapy and we can put the work in can it work but I, I always think about that movie on if you if your partner tells you that they've been cheating on you what is the reaction a lot of people would have is just like okay uh, let's see if we can work on it. This has never happened to me, but I always get this hypothetical in my messages sometimes, which is, you know, what if you saw someone cheating on their spouse? Would you tell the person? And my answer has like, I've never been in that situation and I don't want to be in that situation. But part of me believes is like, keep me out of it because I don't want that couple now performing for an audience of one in the sense that, you know, I don't want to blow up someone's marriage, right? Because you might have a mortgage, you might have kids, not in that order necessarily. You might be caring for parents. Like there's a lot that comes with a marriage. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like, oh, I want to tell him. And I'm like, okay, but if you tell him, you know, A, how is he going to react to you? Like, could you be putting yourself in a potentially unsafe situation. I've certainly watched enough TV where people get murdered over things like this. Right. Um, but B it's like my concern for the couple then is like, can they save this or are they going to start performing for an audience of one? Like if I was the best friend, which I like, I'm a stranger now, but if I, it's my best friend, it's like, you know, make it this, like a part of me would be maybe I don't know. It's kind of, it's like a really tricky situation to be put in. For me, it's only been hypothetical. Thank God. But Mm -hmm. what would you say to someone? Also, do you believe like, I mean, this is a little separate, but it is related because I always get the same DMs, which is like, is it once a cheater, always a cheater? And personally, I don't think so, but. I I don't think that's, I don't think once a cheater, always a cheater, but once a cheater, there is doubt. Mm -hmm. And the doubt is going to be there for a while, and understandably so. I think in the first example that you gave, if you find out that your best friend is being cheated on, right, and you don't want to tell her, and I understand for all the reasons you mentioned, also important. But let's say, let's say it was her husband who cheated, and he knows you know because you saw him somewhere. Yeah, that's different. That in that situation, there was one situation I had with with in a session where that person said to the the man, "You have seven days, or I'll tell her." So he did tell her because he was forced to tell her, but that was what the friend decided made her, you know, which was really difficult to do. But she was not going to hold his secret for him the 
but the burden of holding somebody's secret. That's what I'm saying. Hypothetical. Is, is, is that tremendous. sounds tra that sounds traumatic yeah. for me. Like what you just described yeah. now. I'm like, it's I hard. don't know if I could hold it. You, it's my hair would fall out. That's why this person said, if you don't tell my friend, your wife in yeah. seven days, I will. So he hadn't, you know, he, his choice is diminished since he got caught. Let's put it that way. But she didn't want to hold this. She didn't want to, you know, her friend who she talked to, you know, every day, every other day, pretend everything's fine. It's, it's, it's an unfair burden. What would you say, I know, uh, you know, with financial infidelity, what would you say are sort of the red flags? Are there, is there a way, you know, one of the things that Maria, and I'll, let me preface this by, there's things that I see in some clients that I meet mm -hmm. over the years. And there's always just one client that we, a year that we might have uh, that I'm like, what were the signs? Were there any signs that we could have seen in the beginning of the relationship that could you have mean shown us, us with our clients, us with our clients? Oh, yeah. That uh, sometimes we have to break up with clients. Yeah, because maybe they're not they're not saying who they are or they're exhibiting really problematic behavior on the dates uh, or they're exhibiting some narcissistic personality traits. And we'll, we'll do an audit. We'll see how did, what did we miss? What were the signs that we missed? And it's mm -hmm. always that we, there's no possible way I could have known this in the first month because he's not showing this side of him to us. Right. And so, and I'm always just trying to chase that moment, like where, it, just trying to be more hyper aware of those moments in the beginning. Like where, where is that problematic behavior? Could I have uh, seen it? Could we have avoided this relationship? Could we relationship? have avoided it? And I, and I often, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm hard on our, myself because I'm like, I wish I had seen it. But there's just no way for me to have seen these things because I'm not dating this person. Uh, I have a, a, a relationship, a, uh, we have a work relationship with them. So when you, when with client, with people that you, that are in these sorts of relationships or, you know, financial uh, infidelity, financial abuse or whatever, uh, is there is there red flags? Like, are they presentable in the first stages of the relationship, uh, or is just that's just no way you would just find that out and do the course of the relationship? I think the answer, and, and it's a great question, and I think the answer is both. Yeah. As for you, you can't know. You're not dating the person. You're not yeah. having long drinks over wine for hours on end to notice the signs. If his check bounces or her, her check bounce, if her check bounces, sure, that that yeah. isn't obvious. Or, you know, they say they're going to pay, but then they don't pay you for weeks and weeks later. That is a red flag for you as a as a business model. That's right. always, you know, it's very simple. That one thing is similar of do they do, do they say what they, they're going to do? Do they follow up with what, how it, if it's a day difference? No. But, right. but in a relationship, there might not be anything at that moment when they started dating that would prove l later intent or later um, conflict in that way. Because maybe at that stage, there was nothing that they were doing themselves. And this could be something that they developed later. Right. You know, let's, you know, there's a lot of people who... You know, these days of internet shopping, which we all do to such a great degree, there's an addictive piece to that. So somebody who used to only buy books at Amazon 20 years ago is now buying everything in their house right. from Amazon. And all of a sudden there's an addiction of, you know, that thrill of getting the purchase, of getting the package, of undoing it. Like mm -hmm. that became more of an addictive behavior that happened over time. You're not going to know that. Yeah. In the Even, the, even yeah. the first six months. If somebody has a gambling problem, they may not have a gambling problem when you started before even the first three years of marriage. Right. So, yeah, are there things to look at? If you're with someone, if you're, you know, building a life with them and you're trying to get a mortgage and their credit score is bad, that's a fair question. What's going on here? How do you pay your credit card bills? Do you ha you own an apartment? Are you late on your payment? Because this will affect both of us. Right. You know, credit scores, there's... Or confirmation, you know, sent to your email. Oh, you just opened up a new account, and mm. you did not. 
Mm. You know, there's yeah. uh, with technology, there is a million and a million or two ways to be uncovered. Oh, I left your number as the verification code you know, instead of theirs, you know, there's so many different things. But as far as there's, there's so many ways to get caught. But you don't have to worry about ways to get caught. If you say, yeah, I, in the past, I didn't pay my credit card on time. But Just being I do honest now. about what you did, yeah. and then what you're doing now to fix it. Yeah, because, I feel that way about student loans. I think a lot of people mm. um, hesitate in the dating seen because they have student loan debt and they are like, I don't know what to do about this. And, and my response has always been like, first of all, your payment should be scheduled with the same day that you get paid from your employer. That way you just don't miss it. Right. Like that's just what your salary is, whatever it is, minus this payment. Mm -hmm. And that's what you say. Like I've, I don't miss payments. I'm paying. And yeah. this is how much I make. Like, you know, you, there's a way to have, I think, I mean, you can you're yeah. clearly an expert, you know, so you can there's tell me no if I'm wrong. There's no shame in having there's no shame in having a loan, Debt. especially student loan, because it offered you the education and hopefully a, a career that you can now over time pay it off. Right. It's so common to have to have a student loan like that. But it's like anything else. It's like in a court of law. Never ask a question you don't know the answer to and get ahead of it. Getting right. ahead of it is saying, because they said, oh, do you want to have buy a house in five years? And, and your answer could be, I would love to buy a house in five years, but my first priority is getting rid of my student loan. Right. OK. Yeah. Which, I love that. Uh, which shows interest, intent, and also the ability to think beyond that and what you would want yeah. as a future together. I want to transition into healing because that is a lot of what your book is about. Yes. Um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start a relationship after divorce, but isn't sure if they've healed yet? A lot, a lot of people want to start a relationship. They want a distraction. They want to move on. They want to do something else, but they're not quite ready. They want to feel loved. They want to, of course, they want to feel loved. They want to be a part of something. But I think there you need to have a, a good amount of time. You know, nobody's ever 100% healed. Now I'm ready. I'm, I'm, but you need the shock, the anger, the feeling of being betrayed, feeling as if you're a victim. All of those things are really, really important to work on over time. And all of those feelings are going to come up at different times. Initially, you're going to feel absolutely shocked and then the denial and then anger, and then you're gonna go back to denial, and then you might go back to shock. So there's, going through the healing process, it takes a while. And it's also not just about healing about what happened to you, it's figuring out who you are and what you want, and who you are now, because when that relationship started, that was 10, 15 years ago, and you've grown a lot since then, and what you want is different from, from then. So getting to understand yourself better but one of the most important things that you have to know is that you're not, when you're going on a date or first kind of putting your, your toe in the water, mm -hmm. that you have your anger, you know, under control. That you don't go on, and you could, both of you can speak to this far better than I can, but let's face it, if you're on a first date and you haven't been on a first date in 15 years, the last thing you should bring to the date is your ex, because otherwise there's now three people at this table. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, like I said, you can speak to it far better than I can, but if you're going there talking about your ex, you're not even seeing the person in front of you. For us, the most fascinating, when we have clients that have hired us because they don't want to navigate modern dating. Sure. Um, because um, it's so much fun. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and um, yeah. they'll be, you know, like, let's say they're in their late 40s or early 50s. Like, they truly have not dated in over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, the last time they dated, they didn't even have smartphones. Like, maybe they met their their ex-wife or their ex-husband um, before the invention of a smartphone, which is an entirely different dating landscape. Um, I remember, though, I recall this one client that we had, um, this was years ago, maybe like five years ago, where he he was married in an arranged marriage and this was before smartphones mm -hmm. i mean actually this was like in the 90s so chances are they probably just had beepers right and um and now he was coming into the dating scene 
And, you know, everything has changed. The predominant way to date five years ago was through online dating. She's decided I'm going to hire a matchmaker. Like this makes more sense to me, better use of my time. But because he had not dated in today's landscape, he couldn't understand the obstacles that we were facing in matching him. Mm. Right. And that was really difficult. Like, you know, for instance, he we would show him like, hey, this woman, she's really enthusiastic to meet you. Um, and he would say, well, she's not maybe he would say she's not good looking enough or she's not in interesting enough or she's not smart enough or whatever he was giving us that was just not enough. And I would say like. Sometimes I'd say like, man, if he had only online dated before, hmm. he could have had a little rejection just to see like where he's at in the dating pool too. Like, you know, he wasn't the best Get looking a guy. Humbled. Get a little humbled essentially, right? And I think that's what I feel like sometimes in these, to kind of transition it back to you, it's like part of me is like, yes, he may have healed on what he thinks he's ready to date, but I don't think he was ready to date. But and he wasn't dating, involved. Yeah, dating takes yeah. curiosity. Yes. And if you're not even curious about the woman that's enthusiastic to meet you, I don't know how I'm going to help you. Because this woman that I'm introducing you to, she's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And she really wants to meet you. Right. You know, so yeah. it's like, maybe you should meet her. Like, what do you lose here? And he just wasn't interested in even going out on the first. Like, uh, it was very, um, it was hard. <laughs> yeah, because he, he had his idea of what he thought he needed as opposed to what maybe he does need you know right. what, what th when you interview people and and, and I, I go through this with clients too when they're kind of trying to get back in in that world the list they're married to the list the yeah list. oh the list the list, the, the list the list. I love and, breaking and, down that list. And I and I and you know, like I'll go into obviously, you know, the deeper psychological reason. I said, if if you what your list tells me because it's now two pages typed, you know. Oh, I, I, I yeah, what we it tells me the is, type lists, and I'm like, oh, this is gonna be fun. What that tells me is somebody told you that you should, you know, get out there, but don't settle. You don't want you're not really wanting to because you're married to your list you're not married to a f to, a, to being open to see what's possible i think we have been put in situations where someone comes in with that list mm -hmm. and when i start going down the list i'm like this can't all be deal breakers right okay. and also like let's just pretend this person exists because <laughs> sometimes the person they're asking for doesn't exist right but let's just say this person exists what are the chances that you're on their list yeah. And what are the chances that you value these things? And sometimes I even look at the list and I go, which of these are unearned characteristics? Mm. And then which of these actually matter in compatibility? Because like, you know, we just went through a whole, you gave us a couple's life cycle 10 minutes ago about how, like, for instance, someone might have a gambling addiction problem, but maybe when you married them, they had never been to, uh, they had never gambled before. Like there are things you just don't know until something triggers a certain behavior or some circumstance trigger, you know, has an event mm -hmm. where we learn things about ourselves. How could you know, you know, like, I think, I think ultimately dating has to be a lot about curiosity rather than control. Right. So I want to ask you just like more in questions about, you know, healing, like what are the crucial steps you know, there are people that are listening that maybe they're still mourning what they've lost, mm -hmm. um, but they really want to have another relationship. What are the three critical things that they need to do to heal, to be ready for their next relationship? Or even not even that far, just to date. Right. Yeah, because so many people say, I'm not ready for a relationship. But and that that's good to know that about yourself. I think that's important to know about yourself. But you don't. All you need to do is just go on a date and or have an interesting evening with somebody, whether you want to see them or not, or someone that could be interesting that, you know, maybe turns out to be a friend, but you weren't doing anything that night anyway. Like you have to get you have to understand the fear. Mm. OK. You know, because so much of it the and because Internet dating as I'm sure you hear about because I'm sure a lot of your clients do that first yep. for obvious reasons. The hatred that and the frustration and the loneliness 
and the addictive properties involved in that is enough to make people say, if that's what up. if that's what I have to do, I'm not. Well, I don't think I'm willing to do it. Yeah, because it, it's it's challenging and it works sometimes too, as as we know. But it, it's but there's also fear around it because people are. You know, they're putting themselves out there. They haven't, like you said, they hadn't been on a date in 15, 20 years. They're putting themselves out there and they're vulnerable. And they just, they they had the courage to walk away from their last relationship, but they don't want to run into the other one. But yet, even taking two steps feels scary. Yeah. What's behind the fear? What's the worst thing that's going to happen? And sometimes it comes down to, it's awkward. And... A lot of things are awkward. Yeah, yeah. You know, in order to in order to 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 get something else, you have to do something else. You know, you can't stay home and complain I'm not dating, and then not make any moves to change that. So I think whether it's somebody who's overconfident or somebody who has a to do list or somebody feels so entitled that they have to have the best of the best, I think it's all. A lot of it is just a defense because they're scared. Right. Lisa, this has been an incredible conversation. I want to learn, can people reach out to you? It, like, do you work with, do you still take clients? I do. I do. And if you can't take them, do you refer them to colleagues that you trust? Yes. So, okay, I do good. both. I do both. Okay, great. And they can find you on the show notes that we're going to have all those links sort of find you. Yes. Um, probably the best way is my website, which is lisabraitman.com. Awesome. And do you have Instagram? I do not. You don't? Are you sure? I I'm feel like we have an Instagram link. Yeah, I hope not. It's not mine. Oh, no. <laughs> I, we have a LinkedIn. Yeah. My website is the, is <laughs> if, if you want my attention, go to my website. Yeah. We're all going to put the, I'm going to put Lisa's website in the show notes. I think this is really incredible. Com this has been an incredible conversation. I'm also going to put a link to her book for those of you who are currently in the healing process, who need to figure out how to divide things and how to organize your emotions and also strategize the future. Mm -hmm. Lisa Braitman's book, the courage to walk away has it all. It really does. I loved, I love this book so much. Um, I mean, it's establishing privacy, uh, boundaries, shifting your dating mindset, like, you know, for future relationships after going through trauma. This has been awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Lisa, thank, thank you. you again for coming onto the podcast. Matchmaker Krasula, thank you for joining me again here. Thank you. I love it. Uh, it's great. And for those wondering, I'm the oldest by just one year. Just want to point that out. <laughs> She's the tallest too. I am like, I'm a lot taller. I am 5'11 <laughs> and you're 5'6? I think I'm 5'4 and a half or something. You did not have to correct her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate your honesty. Yeah. <laughs> we, we could never share you? clothes. We could never five, share six. clothes. 5'6? Five, five, yeah, six. we've never shared clothes ever. Not even like shirts. I mean, I'm about to. I'm going to borrow this? Yeah, I think okay. so. Thanks. That's cool. You got it. You got it. <laughs> it's an easy thing to put in your yeah, suitcase. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Lisa Crisula, thank you again for joining me. And thank you for listening or watching Ask a Matchmaker. If you're listening to this, subscribe, tell a friend, send the link to everyone you know. And if you're watching this, help me with the algorithm, guys. Comment. Tell us what your favorite part about this episode is. Tell us about your healing journey. Tell us how much you loved Lisa on today's episode in the comments. Like, subscribe, tell your friends. And of course, as always, be lovable, but more importantly, be likable. See you next week.